Yeah. What's the daily word? Daily word. Daily word. Daily word. Daily word. Daily word. Daily word. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. You're now listening to the Bay Talk for you. I'm your host Sal, and we're back. Today's show is entitled "Who Are the Children of Israel." Once again, today's show is entitled "Who Are the Children of Israel." Before I introduce my guest, my special guest, I'm gonna give you guys a few brief announcements. Um, basically, we're on iTunes. Um, if you want to go on iTunes and never miss another show, just go to the podcast section of iTunes. Uh, type in the Bay Talk View. That's the Bay Talk, the number four, and the letter U. And uh, basically, you could catch all the shows. Also, for those of you that want to, you know, leave a question or a comment, you can email me now. Email me at debatetalkforyou at yahoo.com. That's debatetalkforyou at yahoo.com. Um, my special guests, I have well, well, introduced my first two special guests. They're from Israel United in Christ. Um, they have a school located in the Bronx on 988 Burke and 3049 Paulding Avenue. Uh, basically, they, these guys teach all over. You know, they've been in uh, Texas. They've been in Chicago. Uh, they've been in Orlando, Atlanta, you know, teaching and spreading the word everywhere. Yeah, you know, this is my Israelite brothers right here, Deacon Ethan and Elder Canal. What's going on, brothers? How you guys doing? Good, good. How you doing? All right, all right. And uh, my second, my third special guest actually is uh, my brother from Straightway Truth. Uh, he has uh, his own blog talk radio show as well. Um, and also he has a website, onlinechurch.org. This is Pastor Dow. What's going on, Pastor? Shalom, shalom, shalom. Doing well. Shalom. Thank you for having me. <laughs> shalom. What's going on, man? All right, well, I guess uh, the first question I'm going to give it to Deacon Nathan. Are you ready, brother? Ready for the sure. question? Ready to go. Ready to go. All right, so tell the listening audience your testimony on how you decided to become an Israelite. Um, well, I've always been an Israelite. It was just a matter of me learning it. Um, mm -hmm. I learned I was an Israelite when I was back in 2001. Um, I was I come I was walking across the street and I seen brothers out in the street teaching and it, it caught my ear. I, I kind of didn't pay attention to it. And then later on, as time went on, I met another brother that I was an Israelite as well, and he put me on to more understanding of it. And eventually, I came to the knowledge that I was I was Israel, and mm -hmm. I was around 01, and that's how I pretty much. Um, and then later on, I I joined this congregation a few years later, and I've been in the truth ever since. <laughs> Okay, okay. Now, I see you guys teach everywhere, man. You know, I see Tennessee, Oklahoma, all over the world, man. That's good. Yes, That's we have, good, we right have uh, different branches all over the world. We have a branch in Florida. We have a branch in Texas. We have a branch in um, uh, California, Atlanta. We're all over the place. We've been trying to bring forth this word to the best of our ability um, throughout the states, you know, to okay. venture to the four corners of the earth That's as possible. Cool. What about you, Elder Tana? Like, you know, what, what's, tell us your testimony. How do you decide to become an Israelite? Well, first, I want to give all praises to the Most High in Christ uh, for giving us the opportunity that we might share this word with all those that truly uh, believe in the keeping the commandments, and that is by the lineages of Israel. Uh, but my testimony, I would tell you, brother, is that honestly, I wasn't looking for the truth. <laughs> um, uh, I uh, came to truth in uh, '95. <clears throat> I really came to the truth, trying to prove it wrong, proving that it was a lie, that mm. God only loves the Israelites. Absurd. And I uh, uh, sat down, and a brother I, I knew who was an Israelite uh, for many years was trying, prior to that, was trying to show me, but I dispelled it until the most High put me in a situation where he cut off all avenues for me uh, financially and uh, made me have no choice but to accept that uh, this truth. And I prayed to the Most High to bless me with a job. And I told him, if you bless me with a job, I will come and serve you. And uh, I got the job, and from there on, uh, you know, I've been here. So uh, myself, uh, I came in uh, under duress, I would say, meaning that I was put to a test. And when I heard it, I didn't believe. I tried to question it. I studied, trying to find loopholes. And every time I came with something, uh, the Most High revealed an answer to me. And... I know from here on in, there's no turning back. Mm, okay. And what about you, Pastor Dow? You know, what's your testimony? How you decided to become a, a Israelite? Well, I think um, considering everybody's on the show tonight, I don't think uh -huh. that none of us has ever decided to become uh -huh. an Israelite. 
I, I believe that we were born Israelites. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I, I went the same route as the majority of the people who have faith today. Um, I um, went through the Christian way for a while, and, and then I got separated from the uh, Apostolic Church. Um, I moved out on this land where I resided now by the direction of the Bible. I moved out here in 1998. I started to uh, teach strictly from the book and separated myself from the vain religion uh, that we've all been influenced by. I started seeing in the book, as the most high began to show me, that, that um, we're Israel. And then knowledge starts to increase the more I separated myself and the more I started studying the Bible. I was telling my father that we were Israel. Uh, and as I began to go into it, I was still, you know, preaching, being a Christian as well as being an Israelite. Then I finally came to the crossroads that you just could not make the religion of Christianity fit well, with a Hebrew book. Yeah. I started um, to preach exactly what the book says, not from and that is pretty much how I've gotten to the point where I'm at today in this journey. And you have said, I think, the most high um, for eating guiding uh, into his path of righteousness thus far. Yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear a couple background noise behind you, my brother. It's like giving us feedback, man. Yeah, I hear some uh, some feedback. Maybe you could go somewhere where it's, you know, quiet or lower the volume on the speakers. I hear some background noises. Maybe you get a chance for uh, Pastor Dowell. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly what it is. I'll tell you what i do. I'll try to cut a feeder right here and, and see mm-hmm. what happens. Okay? I'll try to cut yeah, a no feeder and see what happens. No problem, brother. No problem, man. Um, all right, so Ezra Kanai, man, I'm going to give you this question right here. Uh, tell the people what you believe are the misconceptions about Hebrew Israelites. What are the misconceptions? <laughs> hey, before we go uh, up into that, i just call you right back. Yeah, yeah, just call, call right back, brother. I got you, man. Because this phone right. line is really not doing that good. Yeah. All right, man. Let's call back, my brother. All right. Yeah, so there, Elder Kanai. Come on. So I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions uh, about Israelites is that uh, we walk around uh, angry. We are a hate group uh, mm-hmm. that we're looking to take down the government and mm-hmm. kill all white people. And, uh, that's absurd. Uh, the Israelite movement is about the reawakening of God's children to his commandments. And, uh, you know, you, you sometimes if you're familiar with Israelites in teaching the streets, you might seem very passionate, screaming and sounding loud. Uh, but the most high commands us in Isaiah 58, in verse 1, to speak like that. Uh, our Lord is Savior. When he dealt with the people, he rebuked them harshly. And that's the posture we're supposed to take because we understand the urgency of repentance. So if you have a second, if I can read that scripture to you. Yeah, yeah, brother. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 1. It says, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. So the prophet Isaiah was commanded the Most High to cry out to the people, which we are today. We are the modern-day prophets. And we cry out to show them their sins. And it says, don't spare their emotions. So sometimes uh, Christianity for such a long time has put this effeminate spirit on Christ and the apostles and the way the Bible is to be taught. And that's not true. You know, when we're on the street teaching, we're not to spare people's feelings. We're to tell them because we love them and we want them to understand the urgency of repentance. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Pastor Dowell, man. Can I can it, can it get back? Yes, sir. That's I'm here. How's that? Right. I got you, brother. Yeah, it sounds better. It's much better, man. <laughs> All right, so Deacon Aiden, man, what about you, man? Like, what are the misconceptions? Do you, you know, are, what are the misconceptions about the Israelites, in your opinion? One of the biggest misconceptions, um, I would say also, are um, they say that we're full of hate and that we have no jobs and, we don't, and that we manipulate women, and that's, that's far from true. Um, according to the scripture, it tells you that if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So we are required to have jobs. And a man is the head of the household. You read First Corinthians 11, verse 1 to 3. So we're to be the head of the house and we're to take and keep order and structure in the household. So we're not beating our women up and we're not walking around homeless and no money and no jobs. So that's 
out of order. No, that's one of the biggest misconceptions I've heard people say. You know, guys don't have a job, you need something to do, and we all, all the brothers in our congregation have jobs, and we all are happily married brothers with wives and, and children, and we provide for them, we take care of them. So that, that's another, mis, one of the biggest misconceptions I've heard, you know, yeah. above, above yeah. all of them. Mm, what about you, Pastor Dow? What are the misconceptions? Well, given the geographical location that I reside at and I'm in, um, I would say more than anything uh, that people who refuse to do that due diligence and check out what we're actually uh, preaching and teaching, uh, I deal with a lot of discrimination uh, and racism. You know, a lot of people will think that we exclude people uh, from the covenant because we have chosen to actually preach and teach the real true history of our people. Uh, yes. And so in the area that I'm at and what I have to deal with, um, you know, all, all of our life, uh, we as the black men, uh, the black women, and, you know, we've been told that we're nothing. Uh, then mm -hmm. we come to find out who we are, and, uh, and, and, and the book is speaking for us, and is actually, we are the people of the book, the beginning people of the book, the actual, um, the people who the Most High had actually started this all with. And so um, I deal with people all the time trying to uh, accuse me of, of being a racist and being discriminate towards other nations. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, Deacon Nathan, yes, how, can, how can we know who are the children of Israel? Like, you know, that's the title of the show, so I guess we're going to break that down. How can we know who are the, ch uh, who are the children of Israel? Well, that's, that's very simple. Um... When you go into the scriptures and you read about the children of Israel, their, how they were, how their features, how they were a people of a dark complexion, they were dark, they were black people. And when you read, the Lord told them, when you read Deuteronomy 28, that if you didn't keep these commandments, that these particular curses would fall upon you and overtake you as a nation. And those curses, one of those curses was that the Most High was going to remove our nationality from us, our knowledge of self, our laws, even our land, our culture, everything. And when you ask, so even today, if you ask 10 black people or Hispanic people, what's your nationality, you get 10 different answers. So when you read the scriptures, it, it reveals to you that our people are going to be called by bywords and, and proverbs and, aston and astonishment when you read Deuteronomy 28 and 37. And a byword is a name called outside your own, like Negro or Afro-American, African-American, Jamaican, Haitian, or Puerto Rican, Dominican. So when you go into the scriptures, it tells you that our people are going to end up being served, sent to our enemies by the Lord, okay, and forced to serve them in one of all things. When you read Deuteronomy 28 and verse 48, and he says that he shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck within the same verse. And the people who had yokes of iron upon their necks are our people. And then it says, until he had destroyed thee, meaning once the chains came off, we were destroyed. A lot of us during slavery, we ended up returning during the Emancipation Proclamation. A lot of us returned back to slavery because that's all we knew. And that mindset still on us today. A lot of our people are still in that slave mind, low self-esteem, no knowledge of self, uh, um, hate themselves, love their the oppressor, dye their hair blind, bleach their skin, not just the women, but the men as well. And our people don't understand that they come from a royal line of people, a royal lineage, and they don't understand that. And it tells you also in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 68 that the Most High is going to bring us into Egypt again meaning slavery, because the nation of Israel at first served as a nation in slavery in Egypt. But he said you're going to go into slavery or Egypt again with ships, okay? And the only people on the earth that were ever brought into slavery were yokes of iron upon their neck in ships and were scattered amongst all nations and were given different titles and names were blacks and Hispanics and they're Americans. They were the ones who underwent those curses. So that's why it says that these, these curses will be upon us for a sign and for a wonder. So, for example, if you drive down the street and you're trying to figure out where to go, you look at the signs that indicate where you go or where you are. Likewise, the curses, those signs indicate where we are and who we are today. And that's how we're able to determine through geographical, through archaeological, through historical information, which, which the Bible provides already, but the history um, pretty much confirms we are, in fact, the children of Israel. You saw the blacks, the Hispanics, and the Americans all fit the same curses, being enslaved in their own land, being, being sold in ships throughout the four corners, losing the knowledge of self, their land, their language, that all fits black and Hispanic. That doesn't, that doesn't fit every single nation on the earth. And that's what the Lord told he would curse. 
So we're living those curses out today. And that's how we're able to turn to determine that. Yeah, what about you, Elder Tanah? What's your take on that? How can we know today who are the children of Israel? Well, the scriptures are, uh, are plain. <clears throat> the scriptures describe is in Deuteronomy 28, uh, Deuteronomy 33, uh, who the children of Israel are. And in the last days, how we're going to recognize them by the curses. It's going to be a sign. So it, it's not it's not so much uh, of, like, because uh, I've heard many Christians before say, well, how do you know in the last days who they're going to be? Because of the intermingling and of nations, you can never be sure. <laughs> That's untrue. Because God's word told us in uh, Job 8 and 8, he said, to make a search of your fathers. And the way we search is that we have to read the curses that was written about the Israelites that were going to be found. And if you fit those curses, then you're the children of Israel, and the inheritance belongs to you, meaning the blessings and the kings, all the glory belongs to you if you repent and believe on Christ. Mm. Pastor Dowell? We, we know, and I agree, everything that the brothers have said. Both of them are correct, 100% spot on. Uh, we know that, that we are the biblical Israelites uh, of today simply because we fit the prophecies of this book. There's not another nation on the face of planet Earth that fits the prophecies of the book, of the Bible, of the scriptures, like we do. Um, we fit it from a, a biblical standpoint, coming from the color of our skin, uh, the curses, um, and, and also uh, the hallmark sign more than anything on us in this last hour we're living in is because uh, we are keeping the commandments. We're restoring everything that has been lost and has been taken away from us. So I really, truly don't have too much to add to what those brothers said because they spoke the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, anybody that has a question or a comment, you can call in at 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, just make sure you press the number 1, and that will indicate to me that you have a question or a comment. All right. Uh, Pastor Pat Dowell, um, <laughs> Can anyone, can anyone become a Hebrew, Hebrew Israelite? Can anyone join? Yes, sir. I believe that anyone besides someone that come from um, the lineage of Esau, uh, that mm -hmm. there's no uh, redemption whatsoever at all for anyone that comes from the line of Esau. And I know many people have many different perspectives based on who that Esau is. <clears throat> but yet and still, according to Isaiah 56, um, if a stranger, a foreigner, if he decides to join himself to this covenant, just like the mixed multitude that came out of Mizraim, uh, mixed multitude came up out of it, and, and the requirements was they, that they had to keep the law, statutes, and commandment as one law for the strange, as one law for them that are born in the land, freeborn, and those of the stranger. Um, yes. and, 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 you know, it, it, it takes a, a lot of study in order to understand this, and that's what I talk about the discriminating part that a lot of people believe that, that we're doing and trying to exclude when we have been excluded uh, ever since uh, we've been in captivity. But yes. from my understanding, and, and here's the big thing, too. Here's another difference. The difference is, you know, many people have different ways of believing uh, when someone receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit just like the apostles saw, ooh, as well as the early assembly had, um, that they did on the day of Pentecost, uh, mm -hmm. and we have signs that follow them that believe. And this is right here is the, is the, the hallmark sign uh, of the Holy Spirit himself, the Ruah, that he only can give to his people, and then the keeping of the commandments. Um, and these are signs that let you know that people have really, truly been transformed and their hearts uh, have, have really, truly changed. So asking me the question, I believe that anyone, anyone but Esau, um, because there's no uh, redemption whatsoever at all, no plan of salvation um, for, for someone who is of Esau. All right, what about you, uh, Deacon Aether? Can anyone become a Hebrew, Hebrew Israelite, anybody? Um, being a Hebrew Israelite is like is a nationality. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of Israelites we share, we all believe that we're Israel, but some, at certain times there, there comes a time where we all will share different understanding. For what the scriptures say, um, being an Israelite is a lineage that people who come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
you are in fact an Israelite. Now, no one can become an Israelite. That's, that's what, like, for example, you have the so-called Jews today, or Israelis, they believe that they're Israelites. You have the so-called Ethiopians today, Falasha Jews, they say they're Israelites. That's, that's false. They're not Israelites. They do not come from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Esau is the brother of Jacob. He doesn't come out of Jacob, but he comes out of the loins of Isaac. He cannot be an Israelite. Only those who descend out of Jacob can be Israelites. Um, when, when you go into the history, when we had the nations amongst us, they were serving us. They're not serving us now. So when you deal with the laws of the stranger, the other nations, they're, we're the strangers right now. So we cannot apply the law of the stranger when we ourselves are strangers in this land. It, it, it's impossible. Right, so um, Esau, as brother said earlier, is definitely not getting, definitely in no way in his right mind getting into the kingdom. And the other nations are going to get into the kingdom when you read Isaiah 14. But it tells you that they're going to cleave unto us and they're going to be, they're going to serve us. And that we're going to rule over them. That's how they're going to be in the kingdom. They're going to be, the, we're going to be the ruling class and they're going to be the serving class. And you go throughout history from the time of the Assyrian Babylonian captivity all the way down to Rome. Every nation that has ruled this earth, there's always, there will always be a ruling class and a serving class. We are the serving class. There's one nation that tells all other nations what to do. Arabs don't tell nations what to do. Chinese don't tell nations what to do. The Japanese don't tell nations what to do. The um, Arabs don't tell nations what to do. The Hawaiians don't do it. So we can only, through process of elimination, understand what nation tells everybody what to do. And that nation is the ruling class. And that nation is the nation of Edom. So that's how we know that um, the nation of strangers, the sons of strangers, they're going to be in the kingdom. They're not, they cannot become Israelites, but they're going to serve the Israelites. Hope I didn't digress. But to make a long story short, they cannot. No, no one can be an Israelite except those who come out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, you got uh, time, brother. You can, you can break it down. You got time. <laughs> you know, so that's what I'm just going to do. Clear. Um, now, what's your take on that, man? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, brother uh, Dow, uh, he, he made a point, and, um, and I want to address the scripture he was using in Isaiah 56. Uh, uh, and uh, Brother Dow, I'm, I'm believing you're speaking around verse 3. Am I correct, Brother? Yes, sir. Okay. If you don't mind for a second, Brother, I want to read it. Uh, Isaiah 56, and I'm going to read from verse 1 so we stay in the vein of it. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, the son of man that layeth hold of it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Let not the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit and go back uh, and, and come back to that point where we read it. The mm -hmm. first step in to understand the Bible for any one of us who are by birthright Israelites is that we must be keeping the commandments. You have many Israelites, and that's why in Israel you do have the underbelly of Israel that are uh, hateful, uh, looking to kill, or whatever foolishness are uh, unfit fathers, don't raise their children, uh, whoring out women. But these men, when you hear them preach, the Spirit of God is not with them. Even though some of the things they might be saying is right, but they don't have the full understanding. And that goes for me or any one of us that find a provision for not keeping all the commandments in the Bible that God commands outside of the sacrificial one. So in saying that, for anybody to understand this Bible, they must be applying God's laws according to Psalms 11, verse 10. So I'm going to go back. Verse 3. Neither... Let the son of strangers that have joined himself unto the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. You have to understand in the time period when Isaiah wrote this, what was happening was uh, by that time the northern kingdom of Israel was, uh, was carried away uh, by Solomon Esther in 1 Kings, I, I believe, 17th chapter. And the book of Hosea speaks about it, that they were never going to be, they were not called God's children, and, and God would not call them his people. That was the message the prophet Hosea brought to the southern kingdom, that the northern kingdom are not God's children anymore. So when it says the strangers, the strangers were talking about the Israelites that was going to be carried away. Now I'm going to give a precept to, uh, to help uh, validate the point of us Israelites being called strangers. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, the 25th chapter. 
Um, give me a second. Let me find the verse. 25 verse. Okay, verse 35. Mm -hmm. It says, And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen into decay with thee, thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or sojourner, that he may live with thee. So an uh, Israelite was called a stranger in, in a few cases. One, if they waxed poor, they stole away their land, and, you know, at the year of Jubilee, you had to give it back. But the point was they were referred to as strangers. When we read First Peter's 1 and 1, we were called strangers because we were scattered. Now, yeah. I want to go from there to the book of Hosea to, uh, to make my point of what I was saying. Uh, Hosea uh, chapter 1, if I'm correct, verse, yes, I'm going to start with verse, let me start with verse uh, 4. Uh, I'm trying not to be long-winded, but just bear with me. Yeah. Uh, Hosea chapter mm -hmm. 1, verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel, referring to the northern kingdom. And it shall come to pass that day that I will break the ball of Jezreel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived and bared a daughter, and God said unto her, Call her name Loharamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horse, nor by horsemen. And when she had weaned Loharamah, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. So God was telling the prophet Hosea, Let them know that these, the northern kingdom, you're not my people, and I'm not your God. That's the reason why they, we, when we get to the New Testament, uh, the, the, the big debate was uh, whether will Christ go to teach, to disperse amongst the Gentiles, to, to raise them back up, because we remembered what was happening here. That's why when you read Acts, the 10th chapter, in Cornelius, the, the amazement was these scattered Israelites, these strangers that First Peter's referring to them as, they can receive salvation. So back to, to, to the initial point, back in Isaiah 56. The strangers that were going to be called by his name, meaning those Israelites that want to come back like Cornelius and these ones that, that were of the proselytes that repented and accepted Christ, they also can receive salvation. They also, that was the book of Galatians and uh, Ephesians and Romans, they also have a part to come back into the fold. Yeah, Elder can now hold on. I think we have a question right about now. Uh, sure. 661, 661, you're live on debate talk for you. Uh, do you have a question? Yes. Um, um, hello, brothers. I wanted to ask Pastor Dow, um, what, what the distinction do you believe is Esau? What nation do you believe Esau is, and what um, nation do you believe um, white people are? Well, the, the nations I believe right now that Esau is is actually the nations who are ruling over this earth right now, over this earth right now. And that would happen to be uh, the European nations and all the nations that are cousins to it. Um, as far as white people go, we all know that there are Israelites that possess white skin, that have white skin, have white features um, because of all the intermingling and all of the um, the raping that was going on through captivities. Um, so I understand exactly what, what is being said uh, clearly. Uh, this is why I also say that the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to make the determination, just like when they was over in the house of Cornelius um, and Peter came over to, or Kepler came over to the house of Cornelius, and there was something that was given to the house of Cornelius as well as anybody else who called upon him, and that was called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is the confirmation that Yah himself is given to the people. This is the confirmation that, that um, when Peter got back uh, to Jerusalem and they began to ask him, why were you with these Gentiles? Why were you with these people? Why were you with these uh, 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 nations? You know, it's, it's not right 
for you to be doing that. He began to uh, break down the story of how that Yah is no respect of person, but he that um, uh, <clears throat> um, show righteousness, repent, uh, all, the, all the prerequisites that we need to be doing in order to keep his commandments. That's a, who an Israeli, Israelite is, and nobody can actually fight against the Most High on that. I've got a congregation of full of Caucasians, and every single one of them, uh, either not by birth, not by birth, but by birth and conversion, by conversion, they have become Israelites. Mm. Uh, Brother Deacon Ethan, you want to comment on that? Um, well, as far as being, how do I put it? When you examine history and you examine the scriptures, being an Israelite was not, it was never, ever through conversion. Never through conversion. When you read Romans 9, I'm going to read it. When you read Romans 9, Paul makes that very clear. Because oftentimes, um, even in the Christian church, they say the same thing. That you can be an Israelite, you can become a spiritual Israelite. And that's what I've heard being said. I'm not saying Pastor Dallas saying that, but I know I've, that that sounds familiar. And Romans 9, 3 says, For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren. My kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So when you examine that, Paul is saying according to the flesh are Israelites. So we cannot have a, a person, like a Chinese person, if, per, if I, I want to be, if say, for example, I'm a so-called black man today. I can't say to you, well, I'm going to follow Buddhism, so I'm going to become Chinese. That, that's, that doesn't work that way. I can follow the custom of the Chinese, but I'm still going to be a so-called black guy following Chinese customs. Likewise with the other nations. If the other nations chose to follow our customs, there will still be other nations following our customs. That's why even they themselves, so-called Jews today, call themselves Jewish, because they are as or like our people. I mean, they follow, they portray, they portray themselves as or like our people, but they're not our people. That's what they call, or they call themselves Israelis because they inhabit the land. They're not the descendants of Jacob, but they'll call themselves the citizens or inhabitants of that land. So I don't believe at all that uh, a Caucasian or an Arab or African of any kind can ever, ever be or convert into a nationality. It's impossible. That's my comment. If, if, if you don't mind, uh, brother, real quick, and I don't hope I'm not, you know, uh, imposing myself. I just wanted no, to get it, brother. pick uh, piggyback on what the brother was saying is that um, Israel not in Christ, this congregation, we do not teach uh, to uh, seek vengeance against the other nations. The re you know, because many times when we get into this uh, topic, it, it, it spins in many people's minds as it's a black white or a black Chinese or Israelite, whatever. And that's not the point. We are in the conditions we're in because we forsook the Most High's commandments and he used the nations to punish us. And to coming back into who we are, we must repent and keep the commandments. Now, will there be other nations of people in the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely, they'll be there in the kingdom of heaven. But they will not receive the blessings and promises that was meant to the children of Israel. They will become <coughs> servants. So uh, having the other nations keep the commandments amongst us is nothing new. When we came out of Egypt, they were amongst us. Exodus 20, it says, nor thy man, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ox, nor thy stranger within thy gates. They came amongst us and they had to work. They had to, they had to abide by the, the dietary laws or abide by the Sabbath day laws because they were amongst us. But the blessings, the blessings, because there was a distinction between us and them, that the blessings of the kingdom, even if you have all the nations, meaning you could pick whatever nation on the earth, they want to keep the commandments. In Romans 9, it says, it's not to him that willeth or him that runneth. Because when you read up and above that, it was talking about Esau, which is one of the other nations. It doesn't matter. Even with Ishmael, who would tell you know the Arab, it doesn't matter. They can keep the commandments. We certainly won't do it, but they will not receive the blessings of the kingdom like the Israelites will. They will be servants, as according to Isaiah 14. By the way, the call that you just heard, uh, this is Miss Vera. She was on a previous show, Exposing Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, we're going to have a part two coming real soon. Uh, Miss Vera, do you want to comment on that? Vera, can you hear me? Oh, I guess she got cut off. <laughs> All right, Pastor okay. Dowell, you want to reply? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Let me um, go to the Bible here for a second, to Acts 16, verse 1. 
Okay. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, there was a certain disciple, uh, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish. Now, we know that Jewish is, we understand that. Uh, yes. And believed, but his father was a Greek. Now, we all know that um, that the lineage is determined by bloodline. We understand that. And, and it comes from the father. And my question would be, was Timothy an Israelite if we walk in and go in the same vein um, that, 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 that we're hearing here? Because yeah, we I know... Did. Because we know that the seed passes from the male, mm -hmm. and, and, and the Israel genealogy is reckoned by the male and not the female. And it's clear yeah, that it Satan here in telling us that his father was a Greek. And then it goes on to say in verse 3, him would Paul have him to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Yeah, Deacon Nathan, you want to take on that question? Sure. Um, now, that's the, that's one of the things. That's this is one of the, this is one of the biggest issues that not only Israelites but different denominations come at us with. When you examine the history of Acts, Acts is in the time of Rome. Now, when you read the scriptures, when you read Daniel. He goes over four beasts that were going to rule this earth. When you go into the scriptures, you read about Babylon, Syrian Babylonian captivity. And you read about the Medo-Persian Empire. And you read about, then after that, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, gives you Persia. Then it skips to Rome. So you have to ask yourself, where is the other book talking about the Greeks? When you read the book of Maccabees, it tells you that the Greek, that the Israelites were forced to follow Greek customs or become Hellenized. So that when you hear read the term Greek, definition is a Hellenized Jew, a Jew that follows the ideals or customs of the Greeks. That's why they were called Greeks themselves. So Timothy's father was a Greek following Greek customs. The mother believed, the father did not believe. That's why they had to go and circumcise him, because the father was not following the customs of his people. He was following the customs of the Greeks. Because he was like, like for example, I will be considered an American. I'm an Israelite, but I will be considered an American, or a so-called first will be considered a Haitian or whatever, but I'm still an Israelite. But that's what I'm considered because I'm following, I'm living in America. Likewise, it is real. So I'm going to get a scripture to, to further prove my point in Acts. All right, it's Acts 531. It says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now you jump up to Acts 20, okay, in the same book, Acts 20, verse 20, Paul's going to reveal to us who he was dealing with. And who he was teaching repentance to, because repentance, as we've read, is for the Israelites and forgiveness of sins. Acts 20, verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews, meaning Jews, those who are following the customs of, of, of our Moses, Jews, and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So he was teaching both the Jews and the Greeks repentance. So the Greeks were Israelites who were following Greek customs. Another word for Greek in the script in the New Testament is Hellenists. They were Hellenized Jews following customs, speaking the language, following the customs or traditions of the Greeks. That's why they were called Greeks. And that's one of the best ones. That's why you gotta read the book of Maccabees. That's why you read in John ten, Christ kept the feast of dedication. Where do you read about that, that feast being established? When you read the book of Maccabees, second Maccabees chapter six Verse 6 to 9, you read First Maccabees 1, verse 41, all the way down to 50, it tells you that a lot of Israelites were forced to not circumcise their children and not to, not to in any wise, profess themselves to be Jews. They had to follow the Greek customs. So as generation and generation went on, they became Greeks or Greek-speaking Jews. That's what, that's what Timothy's father was. Okay? So that's, that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, Pastor Dow, I'm going to let you answer, and then uh, Elder Kanan, I'm going to let you come back. Come behind that. Sure. Okay, Pastor Dow. <clears throat> sure. Uh, now, I agree with, with everything he said as far as Israel, the nation, who they are. Uh, I have no, no disagreement whatsoever at all uh, about what he says. None whatsoever at all. Um, but, nevertheless, uh, it's still, it's stating in there. I mean, sure, we can put this together like this, but I'll give an example. Acts 28, 28. Um, 
It says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of Yah is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear. Now, this particular word Gentile is ethnos in the Greek, but it does not teach us, and nor does it tell us that this word is the same word that is communicated over in Acts 6.1 that would give us the word of, of uh, the Grecians, which would be the Hellenists, which is 1675 in the strong. So it's making a distinction there. It is making a distinction there. Um, and, and again, I, I want to say that uh, I hear exactly what they're saying, and I agree with them as far as Israel. Israel is a black nation. Um, but there's uh, anybody <clears throat> still today, if they repent, receive the law, statutes, and commandments, they can become an Israelite. Uh, Elder Kana? Okay, uh, well, <clears throat> back to uh, what Pastor Dowell um, used in um, uh, Acts 16 about his father being called a Greek. Uh, a couple points I want to make. Uh, <clears throat> and to piggyback on what I was thinking that them was saying was that, uh, keep in mind, Paul was called a Roman. So being called a Greek doesn't, is not indicative of being of the nation of the Greeks. But I want to read something to you. This is in Second Maccabees. That's why it's very important uh, for brothers and sisters in the listening audience uh, to make sure that you read the history, uh, read the Old Testament, especially you need the, the Apocrypha, because without that, there's a break in the link. And then when you get to the New Testament and you read the writings of Paul, it's where the confusion begins because people don't, doesn't understand, don't understand that Paul is not speaking contrary to what Christ taught because Christ always taught where the Jews were at, but they think that when most people get caught in the all nations and they have to use the books of Acts, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, which they, they misinterpret and they don't understand. But let me make the point. Uh, back in uh, uh, in Second Maccabees chapter four, I'm going to read um, verse, also verse nine. It says, "By this he promised to assign a um, well." This is talking about the priest Onias. By this he promised to assign a hundred and fifty more, if he might have license to set up a place of exercise, and for the training up of youth in the fashion of the heathen. These heathens back then were Greeks. Okay, and write them of Jerusalem by the name of Antiochians, and rename them Antiochians, which means Greeks. This is another word of Antioch, or when you get uh, Antiochians. They want to rename the people, no longer call them Jews, but call them Greeks. Let's read on. Which when the king had granted, and the king now had granted, which was Antiochus Epiphanes, he's granted them the, the title to be called Greeks, like Paul was called Roman, and he was able to go to Caesar to petition when the Jews were trying to kill him. It says, and which, when the king had granted and had gotten into his hand the rule, forthwith he brought his own nation unto the Greekest fashion. What happened? They began to follow the Greek fashion that goes back to the Hellenizing of the Jews, and then by the time you get a few hundred years later and you get to the New Testament, then you have, when you read, this woman, she was a Jewess, and his father was a Greek. That's why when you read, when Paul continues speaking, and when you read Acts 15 and Acts 21, what was Paul, uh, what was the big argument they were having? Well, they still, at the end of it, they were saying, to him, listen, the only thing you need to teach them is to leave things sacrificed unto idols and things strangled with blood because that's what the Greeks did. They were worshiping Zeus and Hercules and Aphrodite and they would tell them the Israelites that were scattered, listen, the word is for you. you. You were once strangers. You could be brought back into the covenant. You need to repent, and this is for you. That's why uh, Christ told them prior to that, he said, I have sheep that's not of this fold. Them also must I bring in that there might be one fold and one shepherd. Meaning those scattered Israelites that we spoke about earlier in Hosea, that they were not going to be called God's people, the great mystery of the New Testament was they could repent. And it can come in. So uh, that's the point concerning uh, to, uh, to help uh, bring, shed more light on Acts 16 as far as being called Greek. Because keep in mind, Paul also was called a Roman, like today. If, you, uh, if a brother and his wife goes to China and his wife gives birth to a child in China, it doesn't make the child Chinese. He's just, he's just a black person that was born in China. But for some reason, we attach 
and because back then they attached the name because there was some type of prestige, for lack of better words, or <laughs> safety would be named nah. by that. Yeah, okay. All right, well, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, uh, Deacon Nathan, I got this question is for you. Okay. Um, tell us, what, what are the roles of a female Israelite? What, what are the roles of a female Israelite? The roles of a female Israelite. Um, when you go into the book of Titus 2, it explains it. Because oh, that's another misconception. I'll take it back off of that, how they say that we were womenizers and we mistreat the women and we don't and they have no place and so forth but the women have a place they have a role to to, to play and i'm going to i'm going to show it i'm going to read it it's titus chapter 2 give me a minute titus 2 verse um verse two, verse 3 it says the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness meaning they're keeping the commandments not false accusers not given to much wine and teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, meaning clear-minded, to love their husbands and to love their children, because that's not something that's that's or that's natural. It has to be learned. That's what's one of the biggest problems with our sisters today, our so-called black and Hispanic sisters. They don't know how to love their husbands or their children. That's why so many single women today amongst our people, because they have not quite learned according to the scriptures, according to their laws that, that God has given us, how to love their husbands and children. So it must be taught by example by the other sisters who are learned, who are aged. I read on. It says to be discreet, chaste, meaning um, pure, holy, righteous, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. That's something that our sisters have a big problem with, all right, a big problem, all right, obedient unto their own husbands, and that the words be not blaspheming, not spoken evil of. Because if you're an Israelite sister and you're doing everything contrary to this Bible, then the word of God is going to look bad. You're going to make this Bible look like it's nonsense. Because you're an Israelite sister and you're not following these qualities here. So that's one of, the, one of the biggest things. Um, if I may, only one more. It's First Timothy 3 um, and verse, if I, um, give me a minute. First Timothy 3 verse, uh, no, that's, that's, that's it. Titus, Jeremiah 9. Jeremiah 9 as well, because women also they say they can preach and so forth, and that's also another misconception. So I'm going to show another yeah. one. Uh, the Old Testament, where it says who women are to teach, and not to teach an entire congregation, that's out of order. That's not their role to teach an entire body of men and women. That's out of order. I'm going to show you who the most high points the woman to teach. Jeremiah 9, verse 20. It says, Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of, the, of his mouth, and teach your daughters, wailing in every one of her neighbor lamentation, meaning repentance, because when you are in lamentation or you are in mourning, you are in sorrow, you are in remorse. So our sisters are to teach their children, teach the, the sons and daughters, while the husband's out bringing forth the word, doing his job, providing for them, she, she, whatever she learns from the husband, that's what she teaches to the children. The father is the spine, the mom is the, is the, is the foundation, so to speak, and that's how the, the family structure stays together. And one of the biggest things that our oppressors did to us primarily was focus on the women, destroying the black image, destroying the women, and that's why that is one of the biggest, biggest issues that our people have as a nation is the is right woman and her role in the house. Okay, so Titus 2 is pretty much it. Yeah, yeah hold on for a second. I got uh, uh, Miss Vera. Let me see if she's back in. Uh, Vera, are you there? Vera, can you hear me? Yeah, I guess she can't hear me. Uh, she's a female Israelite, too. I just wanted to get her perspective on what you just said. But uh, okay. Elder Canal, what's your take on that? What are the roles of a female Israelite? Well, I, I think uh, uh, Deacon has done, uh, he pretty much covered it. Um, yeah. uh, if I, can, uh, I think, you know, so much that um, uh, most people, they cleave when they see Israelites teaching to uh, many Israelites that, that have a, a negative look on the woman's role. Uh, a woman's part in this, in this play in this kingdom is very, is very vital to us as a family because uh, we're not going to do this alone. But we yeah. all must play our roles, the men in their roles, us as the heads of our household, uh, teaching our wives and our children and our wives, following in with the scriptures and being the help me that they were meant to be. Um, and I think um, that at times you, 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 many times you see a wrong perspective from certain men, uh, how they deal with women, uh, you know, taking advantage of them as far as for sex and what it might be, and just uh, mm -hmm. still doing, as is right, still doing what they did back in the world. But uh, the Israelite woman, it's integral 
in the building of the nation because they're going to be the ones that's going to raise all sons and daughters and teach them. Yeah, definitely. Now, rumor has it that um, the Israelite men can marry more than one woman. I don't know how true that is. <laughs> is that true? Like, y'all can marry more than one woman, stuff like that? Uh, the canal? Uh, no, it's not true. Uh, nah, it's not well, true. Right? Mm -hmm. No, what we do read, well, let me say this. You do read the scriptures of forefathers <laughs> marrying more than one woman. And when you read the mm -hmm. book of Isaiah, the fourth chapter, the Lord said in the last days that will be <clears throat> the blessing for those that endure. But in this time, mm. uh, it's not meant to be. But in, many times, like I said before, you have men that will isolate scriptures that will fulfill their own lust for what they want. Yeah. And, they take it. And, and many times, when you read the scriptures anyway, uh, the, the men that had multiple wives, these men, these men were in situations where they were in conditions that they can afford to take care of them. You know, mm. many of these brothers today are not in a situation where they can take care of them. They're just doing it for sex purposes. <laughs> All right, Pastor Dow, what's your take on that? I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Okay, okay, that's cool. What about you, uh, Deacon Nathan? What's your take on that? The same, the same, same. When you go into the scriptures under the old covenant, our forefathers were allowed to have more than one. Um, and even in the law of the old covenant, it told you a man was not to multiply wives unto himself. It gave a warning of that in Deuteronomy 17. So even that was limited. But under the new covenant. It tells us that 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1 and 2, that a man must have his own wife. And when you read 1 Timothy 3 and 1, it says a man who's in the position of a bishop or a deacon is to have one wife. But, all the, but now a brother will say, well, if you don't desire those offices, then you're, then you're open to have more than one. But every single, if you exclude one wife and you apply every other law, those laws apply to everybody else, including the bishops and deacons. So obviously the one wife also would apply to everybody else as well, so that when the elders pass on, just as Moses passed on, Joshua, who was the deacon of his time, or minister of his time, took Moses' place. When, the, when Christ um, died and resurrected and went up, he was the bishop of our souls. His disciples, or his deacons, they became elders. So the law of being the husband of one wife applies to everyone under the new covenant. And as Elder Kenai, um eloquently put, under <coughs> Isaiah 4 and 1, that's when we'll be able to have more than one when we are reestablished in the kingdom. That's when that law will be reestablished. But in this current time, we cannot have more than one according to the New Covenant. Hey, so, uh, Adun, Adun, won't yes. you go to the scripture and what you just pulled as far as uh, have their own wife and explain it to the office of the bishop that can be of one wife to make it look clear for everybody. First Timothy 3? Yeah. Uh, First Timothy 3, uh, verse 1. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just quoting it because I'm not sure if it's some time we have, so I'm just kind of, but I'll read it. Yeah. First Timothy 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So a man has to have rule over his own house. And all men ought to have rule over their own house. All men ought to be apt to teach. All men ought to be of good behavior. All men ought to not to be greedy at the lucre. And all men ought to have one wife. All men, mm -hmm. including outside of the office of a bishop or a deacon under the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So I hope you understand that. Uh, the number, once again, 646-716-7320. Once again, 646-716-7320. If you guys have a question, make sure you press the number one, and I'll add you into the conversation. Uh, Pastor Dowell, I got a question for you. The next question. Um, do Israelites believe that Jesus is God? Um, I can answer from my perspective as being an Israelite. I believe that yeah. he was the, the Father, the Most High Yah, manifested in the flesh. So, and I'll get a couple of scriptures on that to go ahead and, 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 and back that up here real quick. Yeah, uh, definitely. Okay. I'm going to let Elder Kanai. Elder Kanai, uh, I'm going to come back to you, with the, uh, Pastor Dowell. Elder Kanai, what's your take on that? Do you believe that Jesus is God? No, no. Uh, no uh, Jesus Christ is not God. Um, in Matthew 3, um, the Father said, This is my son whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> so uh, it, it, when the most high, well, no, I don't believe in that. I let Pastor Dow go on the scriptures and then okay, you know, 
You can bring it back to me. Give me a chance. All right, when we go over to John, the 14th chapter, John, the 14th chapter, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and use this uh, as an example right here. I'm about to read quite a few scriptures. <clears throat> no, I mean, this scripture and passage right here says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in, I'm going to read it just the way King James says. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, in the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest. How can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man could come unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. The subject here is Father, and he's asking him, Thomas, clearly. We know not whether yeah. our goings, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come unto the Father but by me if you have known me. You should have known my father also, but henceforth you know him and have seen him. And Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it suffices us. In other words, let's just stop playing around. Just, just show him to us, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that have seen me have seen the father. And how sayest thou then show us the father? We go over to Matthew, the first chapter, and we go over here to um, verse 23. It says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And it shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. We we'll go over to the book of Isaiah, the seventh chapter. And I'm just giving, just, uh, you don't have to read the scripture in context. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So when we go back to Matthew uh, 1. 23, it clearly tells us and it clearly states that that Emmanuel is God with us. But then we go back to Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and the subject matter is the child. And it says, mm -hmm. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Who's this? The child. Counselor. The child. The mighty God. The everlasting Father and the Prince of of peace. So if, do I believe that the Messiah was God? You sure do. I believe he was the Father manifested in the flesh. Yeah, Deacon Nathan, I'm going to let you, uh, you know, get your two cents on that one. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Uh, that's a very tricky question. I'm going to tell you why. Yes, when you read John 1, it tells you that he was God. Yeah, he was with God and he, the world was God. So I'll say yes, and the brother pulled the scripture out of Isaiah 9 and it says it, so I cannot argue it. But I will not say, was he, the, was he God the Father? No, he was God the Son. He was the Son. I'm going to read a scripture to show it. This is Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to read verse, real quick, 13. All right? Verse 13, uh, and it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Now that Son of Man, Daniel saw as Christ. All right, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, these are the angels, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they, and they, meaning the angels, brought him near before him, meaning they brought the Son of Man, Christ, near before his Father. So they're two separate entities. Then when you read um, uh, Hebrews 1, when, when John, he mentioned, uh, John was said, if you have seen me, I've seen the Father, because when you read that oftentimes, one of the biggest things that a lot of Israelites and Christians don't understand is that when Moses spoke to that, to that um, the one that said, I am that I am, in the burning bush, that was Christ talking to him. So when you read Hebrews 1, um, uh, he says, he who has seen me, I've seen the Father. This is what he meant when he said it. This is Hebrews 1, uh, verse, real quick, Hebrews 1, verse, verse, starts off in verse 2, it's verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 2. It says, Have in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Because that's who the God, who the God was in John 1, and that's who the God was in Genesis. All right? There was the Heavenly Father and Christ and all the angels. That was the God you read about. All right? And this, which is the same mighty God spoken of, as Brother mentioned earlier, in Isaiah 9. I'll read on. I'll read verse 2 again. 
having these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, that's the Father, and, his, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Christ is the express image of his Father. So when they asked him, can we see the Father, he said, you already see him, because Christ is the express image of his Father. That's why when you read um, in Exodus 33, Moses asked the same question, can I see you? And the most, most I said, you cannot see me and live. You can see my back parts. So when they saw Christ, they see the Father because Christ looks exactly like his Father. And Christ is the everlasting Father because that's the man, that, that's the God or the Heavenly Father that, that came to them during the time of Moses. That's the angel in the bush. That's, they were, that's who, um, who Moses dealt with. So that's, so that's my take on that. Yeah, uh, Pastor Dow, I'm going to let you reply, then I'm going to get to Elder Kanah. Sure. Pastor Dow. <clears throat> sure. Um, um, the brother said that they were two separate entities, um, which I don't agree with, because 1 John 5, 7 says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We know a spirit, and these three are one. It's not talking about three different, separate, distinct persons. It's letting you know that they're one. Because over in um, Revelation, I mean, John, I mean John the fourth chapter twenty four verses said Yah is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I think true. What, what needs to happen here is that is we have to understand that that Yah is a spirit that has no form. He's a spirit, and and then what we are looking at when we see Christ, uh, we we are looking at just what He said, the express image of that Father, because He had to have some flesh in on in order to express himself and he's the only one without sin and so when it says god 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 is the spirit we're talking about god the father god who created everything and we also talking about god who also manifests himself as a son and then when he also said that without is expedient you that i go into the father because if i don't go into the father then a comforter which is the holy ghost would not be made available unto you and that's what he's speaking about in John, the 14th chapter. And when uh, the day of Pentecost had fully come, he manifested himself, which is the last manifestation of Yah. There go your three different manifestations. There go your three manifestations of him, but yet one. So you, you, you go over into the Acts, the first chapter, that's when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon um, the, the people. And, and that's the last manifestation that we're ever going to see of him until we see him. Um, coming in, in glory, in, in, um, back to this earth, um, to rule and to reign. Revelations 1, uh, verse 18, this will be the last one on this one right here. Revelations 1, 18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell and death. Now, Revelations 1, 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, say of the Lord which is and which was, and which is to come, and then he ends that by saying, the Almighty. Mm. All right, I'll take a will let you answer. But uh, anyone that's listening, to the listening audience, if you want to call in and you want to come into this conversation, uh, is Jesus God, call 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Elder Kanan, you got the floor. Okay. Um, in in uh, John 5, a uh, couple scriptures I want to read. Um, John 5, verse 30. This is Christ speaking. He said, can, I can of mine own self do nothing. I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of my Father which has sent me. He said, I'm seeking to do the will of my Father which has sent me. So let's, so back to the point where uh, Brother Dow was saying concerning uh, them being one. Uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being one. Um, uh, th this should clarify it. Uh, St. John's chapter 17, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read from verse 8. Um, okay, um, first, I'm gonna read, let me read verse 1 and jump on down to verse 8. These words spake Jesus and lifted his eyes to the heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, thy son also may glorify thee. He's making a distinction. Christ is praying into the heaven to the heavenly Father. I'll jump on down to verse 8. 
for I have given unto them the word which thou gavest me. Then they have received them, and have known surely that I came out of thee, that's the one, expressed image, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Mm. It says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Here's the point. And now, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So the one he's talking about, that God and Christ are, on the same accord, one accord. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about one entity, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit being one person or one spirit. It's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're one, meaning what? It's the one accord they're on, and he said at the end of that statement that the men that you gave me, that they be one, on one accord, like we are God. So God the Father in heaven and God Christ, the power, are two separate, but are one, like a congregation. We, we are all separate people, but if we all have one mind, we're one nation. Same thing. It's just, it's just a play on words, how it's being read. But I, I hope that uh, verse 11 helped to clear it up, that he was referring to them, that his disciples and the followers be one, like God and Christ was. May I answer yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to let you answer that, but I have a question also from uh, the chat room. It says, so was Christ praying to himself? That's from Levi 25. Was Christ praying to himself? I guess uh, Pastor Dow will go ahead and uh, answer. In this, you know, it, it, this is a, another one of those questions that has always been debated um, uh, throughout the end of time. And, and a lot of times we try to bring down the most high to our natural understanding. Um, and, and that's just not so, I, because we we were created ourselves in the image of God. Man was. And when you think about this, just to go from a natural viewpoint right here, let's take, for instance, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. And every one of those facets have to be sanctified because our whole spirit, soul, and body have to be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. All of it. We just can't just... Uh, receive the spirit and do nothing about the body, do nothing about the soul. Um, with that, over in Revelation 4, 2, it says, And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. We go back over here to John, uh, the first chapter, and I'll make this quick right here. It says, In the beginning was the word. And we noticed that word that was manifest and made flesh that was Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Um, so Christ being back there at the same time in the beginning because he was the Word, again, manifested, made flesh, clearly seen. And then the Bible says in 110, he was in the world. We're talking about the Word. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then it says in verse 14, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Um, so Christ was the manifestation of the Father that we saw. Yeah, Deacon Nathan, I'm going to let you uh, get in this conversation. What, what's your take on it? Um, I, I want to piggyback off the thing you said about them um, all being one. When you go back to 1 John 5, verse 7 says that they're all one. When you read first, um, verse 7 says they're all one. When you read verse 8, it explains what it means when they're all one. It says, and, these, there, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So it says they're one, it means they're all in one accord. They all agree in one. When you deal with um, uh, is it John 1, when, they, um, when you read Revelation, you read um, there's a Revelations 4, where it mentions, Brother um, Pastor that I mentioned earlier about the when we're sitting on the throne, when you read Ezekiel, it says the same thing as also Ezekiel 1. And when you read John 1, he tells you, John 1, he tells you who that was, that John saw who Ezekiel saw. 
John 1, give me a minute. Uh, it says verse 18, John 1 verse 18. It says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So when you read, so oftentimes I said before, when you read in Exodus, um, Exodus Moses, so that angel in the bush, that was a son. When you read Ezekiel, that, that man that sat in the throne, that was a son also. Revelations, same thing. So when you so oftentimes the most I would declare his son. It says he saw on the throne, but Christ sits in the right hand. It's the same thing. These, remember, John was shown different visions of different things. So the father and the son are two separate entities, however, they all agree in one. The Holy Spirit, when you read the scriptures in Acts 7 and verse 51, the Holy Spirit is the laws, understanding of the laws. Okay, because that was, that was the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit that our fathers rejected. When you read Acts 7, 51, all the way to verse 53, he clears up that it was the law that our people did not keep or rejected. Our fathers didn't don't keep. So the Father and the Son all agree together when it comes to that law. Because the Father has a book in heaven. And Christ came with that same, and Christ came teaching what his father sent him to teach. They all agree in one. John 17, 20 says the same thing that Elder Kanai brought out in verse um, 11 of John 17. And that they're all in one. They're all, let them all be as one. It's all the same thing. It's all the same exact thing. But, but so do Elder Kanai. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, mind, do you mind if I chime in on this one, one more time or something? Yeah, go ahead. I want to go back to what... Uh, our brother Dowell read in uh, Revelations 4, uh, verse 2. It says, mm -hmm. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now just watch this. I'm going to go, remember, when these books were written, uh, books of Revelation, they weren't chaptered. So let's just go back up in, into chapter 3. Not too far up. I'm going to start with verse uh, 20. Behold. I, uh, this is chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I open the door, and I will come to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. And he that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So when it says 1 in chapter 4, verse 2, it's about in rulership. They're going to be ruled together. Now, remember, the scripture says precept must be upon precept. Let's go back to the book of Mark, um, chapter 16, and I'm going to read verse, verse 19. It says, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. He sat on the right hand of God. So it's many scriptures it's distinctively explaining that the throne or being one was at one accord ruling with his father that sent him. Like so I said before, earlier in the beginning of this whole conversation and, and this is blanket for all of us as a people, that the, when we read in Psalms one hundred eleven verse ten, it says, A good understanding have all they that keep the commandments. So we must be keeping all the commandments in the Bible that God prescribed. And if we fall short, we must repent and apply these commandments in our life. And then we'll get the understanding of all we, what he's saying. And we'll understand. And, that's, and this is a lifelong journey for all of us, for Brother Dowell, for myself, for Deacon Nathan. It's a lifelong journey. But if we're sincere and we're going to apply those commandments in all our lives, the Most High will give us the increase and show us that uh, what his understanding of these scriptures are. So I hope, I hope it was clear uh, in those scriptures and it was edifying to the listening audience. Yeah, Pastor Dow, I'm going to let you answer, then uh, we're going to move on to the next topic. We only have like 14 minutes left. Um, go ahead, Pastor Dow. Oh, well, <clears throat> I already said what needed, needed to be said. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I've pretty much um, proved in the scriptures. When he's talking about throne, when he's talking about throne, a throne is a seat of power. It's a seat of power. Um, I, I'll give you an example. If, if we, we, we have two different perspectives of thought. We, we live over here in the West, and, and having a Western mentality, which we have to divest ourselves of, uh, we view things from an abstract viewpoint. And if you go over to the East, and I've been to the East many times, you go over to the East, then people think from an Eastern perspective, meaning more from a more concrete terms. And, and I said all that to say that, when he's talking about throne, he's talking about a seat of power. 
because there's never no separation between the Father and the Son. I think Isaiah was pretty clear uh, when he described the Son, who he would be, uh, being the Almighty, and the book of Revelations uh, ends it himself by saying that he was the Almighty, and uh, that's that's my uh, viewpoint, and that's my take. All right. Uh, uh, six, what, four, what, six. What, 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 uh, brother, I'm sorry for cutting you off. Yeah, I, yeah, I, just wanna, I, 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 I just want to say something, because I, I forgot the thought, it, and when I said this, I want to read one thing to you, and uh I'll end it on this one with concerning that topic. This is uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. It says, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing, sh uh, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? So he came to Christ and said, Good master, what good thing that I might do that I might have eternal life? And he said unto him, meaning Christ, There is none good. He said, Why callest thou me good? So Christ asked the man, Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So, but if thou will enter in life, keep the commandments. So when the, when the man came to Christ and asked him, Good master, what should I do for eternal life? Christ himself humbled himself, even though Christ walked the earth perfectly. He said, there's none good but one, that is God his father. So if Christ was God, meaning the one, meaning he's actually him, manifest himself as Christ, he's telling him that, I'm not good, but God is good. There's too many times we read in the Bible where it makes definitive distinctions between God the Father and God the Son. So on that, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my peace on that. I hope it was better find. Uh, 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Yeah, it's almost, you know, time we winding down for the last 12 minutes. Uh, Brother uh, Deacon Nathan, uh, this question goes to you. Now, I know there's a lot of symbolism when it comes to you know, <laughs> Israelites and the, the garments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, what does the, the six-pointed star represent? Uh, some people actually say that the star, you know, some people use that star, you know, for witchcraft, stuff like that, blah, 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 blah. What's your take on that? Uh, the, same, the same belief that you just brought up. Is witchcraft. Uh, <laughs> that symbol is completely uh -huh. demonic. That symbol is the symbol. I'm going to read it real quick, but it's very, very short. <laughs> it's Acts 7, verse 42. It says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, he's quoting Amos, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me, to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan figures which he made to worship them and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Because that star, it was two sides of the same coin. You had the five point version which is a, which is a pentagram and you had the six point star which was stronger, which conjures up stronger demons than the five point. And those, both of those stars are also, is also called Chun. You read uh, as an Egyptian god of time and harvest. is the same star also. It's a five point or a six point star. And both of them are used for witchcraft and alchemy and also in so-called Jews, they used to have a book called the Kabbalah, which is Jewish, so-called Jewish witchcraft, all right? So that, that star has nothing to do. In fact, it predates the nation of Israel itself. That, nation, that star has nothing to do with our people whatsoever, and there's no scripture substantiating it whatsoever. Devil worship. Uh, yeah, Pastor Devil, what's your take on that? I agree 100%. It is a straight-up satanic star. It is it's there for devil worship and um. Amos 5, the prophet Amos says in Isaiah 5, 26, But ye have borne your tabernacles of Molech and Shechem, uh, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. But over in the Torah, uh, we've got we got prohibitions against these things. we we got uh, laws against wearing these things and, and, and worshiping the host of heaven. Deuteronomy 4, 19 says, And lest thou, if thou lift up thy eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, should be driven to worship them, and serve the Lord, which the Lord, and serve them which the Lord thy God have divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. And I agree with the brother. Uh, Kabbalah, they, they, you know, over the Kabbalah is nothing but Jewish mysticism. And you look in every major religion of this earth today, you, you, every one of them has some type of symbolism that has to do with something that is contrary. To, that was written down in the Torah that told us to not do. I can understand, and, and again, you could get somebody that will wear that star, and they will give you a dissenting opinion. Uh, but to be on the safe side, the bottom line is, 
is, is not to wear them, not to put on it. And, of course, you know, people will say, well, a star doesn't look like this. It's a matter of light and all this and all that. But when you go back and look in history and you look in every single nation upon this earth, and it is not a coincidence that every single one of them have that star plastered all over their temples. You go to China, mm -hmm. it's there. You go to India, it's there. You go to Europe, it's there. You go to portions of Africa, it's there. You come over here in America, it's there. And you go to Canada, it's there. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. And so agreeing with the brother, no doubt about it, that star is a uh, satanic to the core, and I would stay away from it. Yeah, because out the canal, you know, I live in New York City, and a lot of brothers they actually wear, you know, they have the symbolism on the uniforms and stuff like that, you know, with the uh, the, the six pointed star. What's your take on the six pointed star? Well, um, I think uh, I'm on the same line with the brothers. Uh, for for one reason only, it's not in scriptures. I mean, I listen. You, if, if you surf the if you surf the internet long enough, you might find me back in the days with it on because I used to wear it. Uh, but as I grew in understanding, uh, the Bible says, prove all things. Uh, and, and rehearse the righteous acts of forefathers and abstain from all appearance of evil. So as we study the Bible, uh, I ran across brothers that will defend it. Because at one time I might have defended it too if it was posed yeah. as a big evil. But as you read the scriptures, you have to base what we do based on God's word, meaning you got to prove it. So those that fight it many times, I'll tell you, uh, and, and it's not for all of them. I'm not being blanket to all of them because I can understand I came out that mindset. But they'll fight it, but in their lives they're breaking commandments openly, other commandments, mm -hmm. so I can understand why they would stumble at it. I can understand why they stumble because you got to apply it. Simple. It makes no sense fighting it, fighting to, to hold on to something that cannot be proven in God's word. So along with Deacon Thun and Brother uh, Dow, that's witchcraft. And uh, stay far away from it. All those listening, stay away from it. It put, it, it yeah. put the spirits on there you go. Yeah, now we wind it down to the last few minutes of the show. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, but if we happen to go over, you'll just have to, you know, the listening audience will just have to call back 646-716-7320 to hear, the, you know, the last question and the answer to the last question. Uh, I actually have a question in the chat room right now from Levi25, and uh, let me go up to that. And he says, um, do, do you guys believe that America is Babylon? I'm going to start with uh, Deacon Nathan. Hold on for a second. Deacon Nathan? Yeah, I Hello? hear you. Deacon Nathan. Undeniably, yeah. irrefutably, yes. America is Babylon the Great according to Scripture, the land of confusion, the great land of confusion. Yes, according to the book okay. of Revelations. Mm, what about you, Pastor Dow? What's your take on that? I agree that America is part of Babylon. And when I say part of Babylon, because I believe that Babylon is a system. It is a system um, because, you see, we're separated by geographical location nowadays, but it's the same system that has done spread it. And then when I made a statement earlier, uh, America being the cousins to the Europeans, um, that's what I'm making a reference to because this is a system of other confusion. There's no difference between Americans and Brits um, as far as that go. Uh, and, and so I just don't um, put America just to one geographical location. When you look at the three different main functions on this earth today, you have New York City. Um, I mean, you have Washington, D.C., where it has the war power or the arm of the war of this particular system. You go over to London, you have the monetary um, uh, power of this uh, system right here. And we can go on and on and on and on. But that's the reason why that you don't see any. And that system is about to come down all the way around. And um, you, you're looking at it economically, you're looking at it socially, you're looking at it politically. It's coming down. And it's, it's coming down because it's time. Mm. Elder Canal, what's your take on that? Is uh, America the daughter of Babylon? Uh, yes, America is referred to as the daughter of Babylon. Uh, and when you read a revelation that the brother was pulling, Revelation 8, it refers to it as Babylon. And how we know prophetically that it is Babylon is because when you go into the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 14, I'm going to read it real quick. Uh, chapter 14, verse 8, it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So if you, uh, if you do study the Bible, you understand by the time uh, the book of Revelation was written, this is long after the fall of Babylon, that we know it concerning the Old Testament with uh, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. 
That happened thousands of years prior to that. So what is this referring to, the Babylon? It's referring to the prophetic of today, which is modern-day Babylon, the confused land. Yeah, America. Yeah. Yeah, hold on, Elder Kanai. Sorry about that. We've got a quick question real quick. Uh, 347, you're live on Debate Talk for you. 347, do you have a question? Hi. Yeah, this is Brother Kassef. Um And I, I just wanted to say something about the, uh, the, the Messiah being God. And um, this is my own perception of how to deal with resolving that kind of question. Now, I don't think anybody can argue with the fact that the Messiah came out of the Most High. But if there's anything in the scripture where we can show you, I mean, yeah, you have people out there who, you know, they would say that the, the Messiah is the Most High. Uh, but if there's anything in the, in, in the scriptures anywhere that can show you that the Messiah was not the Most High, then it causes doubt to ask him being being such. I, I don't know if you, you guys would agree, would agree with what I'm saying. I, I handle it the, the same way that, you know, the American court systems handle it. There's, you know, if there's reasonable doubt, then, you know, it causes you to question the whole thing. You know, then, 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 then he, 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 the Messiah couldn't have been the most high. And, 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 uh, like, literally. You understand what I'm mm. saying? Mm. I was going to you want to answer that? No, I understand clearly the point he's making. Uh, that, but I, as far as uh, the reasonable doubt, uh, I don't necessarily go that way. I go as it's written, meaning because we, listen, when you, when you read the Bible, if you're not studied anybody, any scripture, and make it sound any kind of way, they can manipulate. Mm -hmm. That's why the scripture says precept must be upon precept. Yeah, but even more importantly than that, you must study yourself, apply these commandments, and the Father is going to give you that increase. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I understand that these scriptures have, that Brother uh, Dow pulled out. I disagree with them based on the scriptures that I gave. And from there, the rest is in the hands of the Lord. You know, those that understand it, it is for the most high to give that increase. But, uh, Can I give one has scripture? Yeah, 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 give, yeah, yeah brother. First um, Timothy 3.16, without controversy. And, and, of course, we know that the word controversy uh, means w w w without, you know, a, a lot of uh, by consent, you know, a bunch of, of people arguing or professing, you know what I mean, or conceding, refusing. All, it goes on and on. It changes on and on. But it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then it's going to go on and define. It said, God was manifested in the flesh. Mm. If you paint yourself, there go your flesh. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Look what else this God did. He preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Yeah. All right. Well, we're down to the last few seconds of the show. I want to thank my special guests, Deacon Nathan, Pastor Dowell, and Elder Kanal for joining us and bringing forth the knowledge to the masses out there, to the listening audience. I want to thank everybody for listening, and also the people that's in the chat room. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Have a blessed one, guys.